Well, quite why, uh, so I agree. Uh, I'd say quite why is a, a greeting of your, um, from basically all of you in this book, um, right up to me, um, and then uh, on to the jury and everything as well. Um, just a general pearl point. And, uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, raise your hand if you guys saw the, the, the watch the so I guess we're going to show some clips. Um, the, the one part that I, uh, what I want to try to invite you guys to think, uh, we talked a little bit about suspending on this how do so kind of And that's something I really want you guys to do is, um, and kind of having what I would call a dilemma. As though, not that I know, not that you know, but any of us know. But to really look at what we're going to see here, what I'm going to talk about in the place of that would be close. The reason that I'm going to do that, I'm going to talk to you guys if you listen to the dialogue and so That's no interest in that conversation. So I want to include you guys in as equals, um, as just fellow human beings. We're both looking at a weird painting that one of the things I've seen. And uh, we don't know what the medium is. We don't how it was done, we don't know who the artist was, and we're just going to look at it with the eyes. And then I want that conversation, uh, I want you guys to have that conversation as though we're just exploring this together. And we're exploring it without any bias as much as possible. So that's kind of my, my MO. The reason for that is if we can do that, not just here, but throughout any social issue that we want to explore. I really believe that that normal mind, keeping 20% of that question is a question of beliefs or a construct, and just saying, you know, how much do I really do? And uh, so that's that's kind of the, the motive that I'd like to, to take this. So,
seeing here is um, it's, it's discussing how Aboriginal children, there's a lot of uh, laws and policy in the world um, to take Aboriginal children out of um, their, their homes from their parents. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, some, some of which, like at this phase of what we're looking at, this was uh, I think early 1900s, where there was actively a policy that found um, set precedent to take native children out from their um, from from their communities, from their parents. And a lot of times the excuse that was given was to say that the parents themselves were like this. And that the standard that they were being compared to was to the counterpart of the Euro American more or less policy and tactic standpoint of what constituted the And so there's a lot of a lot of ways that they were taking uh, native children out from their communities and brought, some, in some cases, long distances away to various residential schools. Uh, calling them a school is a reach. It's, uh, you know, in some cases, they were really more like an orphanage, where it was a very strong assimilation policy. And uh, so, it, some, in some, some ways, it was managed state by state. In Canada, Canada had a much more broad sweeping way of doing it. Um, they, were forcibly taking children as little as here they wouldn't be able to start school. So like talking two, three years old. Um, and then brought to these um, often in Canada it was a, a school that was run by either the, the province or usually a Catholic church. So um, kids were rounded up sometimes in uh, manure wagons, whatever whatever means they had to just get a lot of kids and take them from their parents and bring them to the rest of the school. In Canada, there, there was, they, didn't, they didn't need to protest whether the parents were fit or not. It was law that basically kids had to be pushed off, um, registered Native American children had to be brought to these schools. So, um, as you can imagine, uh, there's a little trauma there for, for, for people. And it was, Simultaneously, what was also going on there was a lot of uh, tuberculosis and other uh, diseases that made COVID look good to go. Uh, they were sometimes putting kids into uh, housing where they knew there was children who were actively uh, sick and with tuberculosis and they were housing children all the way under one roof. So if you were healthy, you probably weren't for long. Uh, so, yeah. So Maine had a similar thing that uh, it was done basically because they were trying to say that certain parents were not fit. So in some cases it was just like kind of seventy-five percent more likely that a child would be found that they had unfit parents than uh, non native parents. And they were brought out to these homes and foster parents that a lot of abuse and deculturalization ensued. So, for better or worse, you know, we're living now in a, we're, we're trying to do things, society is trying to make amends, so to speak. And one of the main, I think it was 2012, it was the first uh, state in the country where they developed something called the Truth and Reconciliation and the Child Welfare Act. And this was a way of trying to look at the damages that were done as to why these children were taken from them and getting statements about their experience having been removed from their communities, from their, from their families, and then um, what kind of cultural detriment that has, what kind of psychological detriment that has. 
And uh, and now the this commission is the first one in the country to, to look at what we now think of as an unconstitutional law that um, is now trying to rectify and trying trying to figure out a way to reconcile that. It's a really it's a really touchy subject. And um, so there's there's a there's a number of concerns about this. Um, one of the biggest problems that really I think happens with when when children are not just the age of it's in a child. If any of you know or work with children who are taken out of their homes for whatever reason, there's a lot of trauma that's going to see. And then in the throughout the era where cultural sensitivity is non existent, eventually there's a lot of that actively work towards taking culture. And so these children are oftentimes seen as second class citizens and um, to really objectify. Uh, I, 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 I want to talk about both the solution and, and the problem, but there's you know, identifying the problems which basically it's additional. <laughs> I didn't plan to talk about that that much. One of the things that happens is child abuse is a ramp in all of these situations. And uh, so it's, I, at one point I heard a, a, an average, I don't know how accurate, but I think it's quite accurate, anecdotally, I think that's how you know this is quite accurate, that it's about sexual abuse in native communities at this point, or in where children are put into non native homes, um, is sometimes 11 times the national average. So um, it, you, you can see how this. You know, it, it, you know, and then the sad part is, is that it, it, it sets up this crazy, crazy standard of, of mental health being extremely low in the communities and native communities as well. And so the, the cascading effect of this over time uh, is unbelievable. Uh, so I, just on a, a quick note, I, my ex girlfriend, um, her father is a really well known artist. And I was living in Alberta, and um, his name's Alan Shaver, and uh, he's, he tells his story of the so I can do it. Um, one point, he was at a group of associations residential uh, school, and he was sitting in the hall of there as little kids. And he, they were walking up a set of stairs in this school, and they had those old school uh, radiators, those radiator heaters, you guys have all seen them, big cast iron guys kind of the bottom of the stairwell. And the priest was that angry at a child who probably was just being a normal kid, just being kind of bratty. Back in the kid, the kid fell down, smashed his head away. This was almost like a weekly occurrence. So the, they, they, Alex had to witness this happen right in front of him. And then but what would happen is a lot of times they would sleep in the well. And uh, they would then say that, you know, they'd make a report to the parents and come up with some, you know, bogus report uh, as to what this was happening. I have a, another elder of mine, which recently passed away, um, Rosie's Gable. She had nine, she was one of nine children. Only her and her sister survived residential school. So, like, this is, we're not just talking one or two, we're talking about seven of her siblings. Died because of the diagnosis. So, it, needless to say, it's you know these kinds of stories are epic. So now there there's similar types of stories that happen also too in, um, in the United States. Uh, there's a school called the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania. There's a number of these places that were that were done. So now we're trying to Maine is trying to try to find a way to come to terms with. Their, their role in this, and um, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing issue. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
So I, it's, there's been a lot, I don't want to talk too much about the horror stories. Just, all you got to know is it's really, really bad. It's not good. You get that point, I think we're kind of on the same page. Um, and the, the, the question, which was interesting, is one, there's one point where uh, there's a, a Lakota woman who is, they're in Maine, and she's at Sabani, which is passing a quad years old. And uh, there's uh, this, one woman is part of this council, right? Um, and and she's and there's one of the elders is there who went through this. She was she was an uh, adoptee that was brought into this uh, into, into foster care, and who was molested in the whole nine yards. And you can see as she's starting to talk, you can see her, as she starts to disclose, she's having this catharsis about how painful this was. But the, the trouble, where I found it really interesting was, she says, the, the, the passive body elder says to this, this um, council member, she says, what do I do with this pain? How do I, how do I heal this? You know, I've been on all this medication and blah, 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 blah. And you can see, I can see, from my perspective, what I thought was, um, she was kind of stumped. So she kind of gave her this quickie response a lot of times. It was the best that she had, but right? it was limited. She said, well, we have our medicines, you know, we have sweet grass, and we have uh, burn sage, do this. The trouble is, how, that alone probably is insufficient. And, and it's, it, these kinds of things, uh, trauma is not a native problem. Trauma is a human problem. And that's, the, that's my point about all of this. That's why I want to bring you guys into this and you know, make it a capacity of conversation. Trauma screws people up. And there's, it's, they're trying to figure out ways, and we try to sometimes integrate our culture into that. But one of the things, my personal feeling, and one of the things I've observed, um, and you gotta understand, it's, this is my opinion, but it, it almost doesn't matter if you have a dogmatic belief. Any kind of dogmatic belief, you know. Um, if I have a dogmatic belief that somebody can spell it, okay, and I believe that, well, there's some merit to it, but it's only primarily here. The trouble is, is that I, I think that we try to sometimes use those dogmas to try to help people, but in the end, because it doesn't really get to the issue, that we can do all the ceremonies that we want. And then that may make us feel a little bit better, but there has to be more. It's, it's, it, there's more complexity to the end of chronic trauma. PTSD is a is a is a point of So I, I I was kind of hoping I, I felt bad because that woman was talking to her and her answer was not sufficient. And I've, I've heard the same thing a lot in the movies. Like, you go to ceremonies, and yeah, sure, people understand the ceremonies. We, you know, you go to, you can memorize thousands of songs, you can go to Sundance, you can do your sweat, you can do all these things, but uh, the trouble is, is that it never really gets to, to where the issue is. It just becomes another religion. And you take your pick of what religion you're going to follow. If you get too lost on these kind of dogmatic ideas, it's kind of magical thinking. That's not what trauma is. And in my, this is this is my opinion. You can use ceremony in these things to help maybe strengthen that, maybe a sense of community and not feel alone in that. But there's a lot of times in our communities, one of the things that I've experienced is that I see tremendous dysfunction right? and, and happening around me. And, it's, and then, but it comes ceremony time, everybody's on, on the best behavior. Right? Two days. And then, you know, they're all doing their thing and they're all kind of, you know, signaling that uh, they know the ceremony, there's no doubt. But then the ceremony's done, it's no different than anything. <laughs> you know, it's like people cutting each other off as they leave 
mask um, in each other really to consider to defend his life. He doesn't carry over. The action, there seems to be some dissonance there. You know, there should be a schism. And so things like trauma are not well addressed, but just in one way. Or just medication So, I don't know. The, the, I, I do like that they acknowledge some of these things about like taking, they, they, they wipe their tears with Kleenex and the of the cup. There's symbology, but again, I think if, if we get hung up too much on the dogmatic aspect of leaving this movie, really what's going on, and there's going to be some magical solution for that, then we're going to be a polygraph. So we have to understand that us as individuals have to go in deep and we can look at where these issues are in our present humanity. It's not a good thing. I do want to make a Yeah, jump in. Yeah. Yeah. Right in there when we. Do you have any um, folks online that have a good question or perhaps have seen this before? I by the way, it's a golden eagle feather on there. So in the ceremony, we use a feather as a symbol of the um, speaking true as possible. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm just, um, I'm just reflecting on what you just shared, um, and uh, that it's like I, I don't, I don't have the answer. Um, but it, it was a, it was a contrast between what you. What you just shared and what um, some folks, at least that I know, are standing around here. Yeah, I'm sure. And, it, <laughs> and at the same time, you know, there are people who are still on their land, and so they are, you know, a lot of what, uh, from the perspective of the people that I learned from, that um, they were sh sharing things that a lot of the the healing was coming from the fact that their ceremonies and their way of life. That they that they were bringing back were connected to that very same land. So I don't know if that it is um, some of what makes it different for them, or, or I don't know because I'm still trying to reconcile. That well, we're we're on our land too. Oh, that's that's true. Yeah, that's, that is true. So uh, you know, I, I think it. Yeah, go ahead. What what else? No, I'm, I mean that that's basically. I'm just I'm. Because I also hear what you're saying too, so it's not so I'm not sharing this to um, try to push back or try oh, to it's more just to yeah. grapple yeah. more to grapple with what you're sharing because it's sure. because I hear you and it yeah. makes sense to me yeah. and it's also like I'm feeling this tension with kind of what uh, I felt like I was taught by others also. That's all. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Your name again. Was it? Anna? Anna. Uh, Amen. Amen. Okay, so good. I'm glad that you have that out of perspective. Um, and because the, uh, I, I wish there was, we had a few more native folks in the audience because I am challenging this. The reason I'm challenging it is um, I, I, I want to be careful that I'm not just doing this to air the laundry. And one of the things that I find, now take your pick on whatever social issue you want to look at. We, there's, there's two ways of seeing it, or a multiple bunch of ways of seeing it. One, you can say it's the inside view. Like if this was an all native audience, right? That it would have a certain feel to it. It have a certain speed to it, right? Ultimately, it's still just a group of people. And that's what we forget. Now, now this thing, so there would be, you know, I would have a lot of that where we'd say, well, look, you know, you're just showing how we understand something, blah, 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 blah. And there may be some, some truth to that. But the, 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 the problem with this is, is that in any of the social issues that come about, the one thing that I can see us doing is talking about what our responsibility is. 
there's, there's some of it, but there's not enough of it. I think part of it is we don't want to show up as on our face. And it's much easier to, to point fingers and blame, to blame and praise game. My question is what, what, what comes from that? How, what solutions are now coming from that? Um, and when, when I talk to some of my other native folks, is they're, you know, very quick to say, well, that, like, say, using the residential schools, for instance, like, well, we did this once, they did this once, they did this once, they did this. But then I, then I see this incredible dysfunction and poor behavior happening between my own people, where we are the masters, we may not have invented it, but, you know, we've mastered that cracking on each other. And, and doing things in a way that sets us up to be in, in, in some dysfunctional, bad situation. Now, there's a point where it's good that we have all this, of any, and again, this is, this is a human issue. Are we in this together? You guys realize it's all, we're all human? Okay? You no, know, you know, let's all forget about what race we are and what we're, what are the needs are. That, if, if we're not looking directly at what our own behavior is, if we're intelligent enough to make a documentary, the implication is, is that we're intelligent enough to start thinking about our responsibility. That's the one part that I'm, I'm getting a little tired with our social movements and whatever the, whatever the cause is, we're getting hung up on the virtue signal, the signal itself, but not the actual virtue. And that relies on our own it doesn't matter what, what thing you're, you're involved in, political, social stuff, you know, gender, identity, it doesn't matter. We have to look at what our own role is. And that goes the same for any person. And the, the thing that I observe a lot of times um, is that I watch people that know thousands of songs, that memorize these songs, that know ceremonies in and out. Not here, but I'm talking in the, in the Cree territory, they Cree, the place Cree, um, the heel are really, really good with um, song, ceremony. I mean, they have ceremonies for ceremonies. But the day to day life is kind of like there's a lot of stuff that's happening where it, you know, it doesn't really matter how much you know or whether you're a pipe holder or whether you are, you know, what your earnings is. Because that be, that can kind of cause you to think that you don't have to work on yourself. I mean, where where else in history have we seen that happen? I mean, how many how many has there ever been a problem with Catholic priests? I mean, these are ordained people, and some of the that have done some of the worst things to people. So, like knowing knowing these things, being mocked in these dogmas, does not free us up from our responsibility of what these are. Another cue that I would say is I was doing ceremony um, on the Nakota Reserve um, with a guy named Larry Beaver. He had a uh, scapula. Scapula was a junior of some of these learning, studying. And man, the most beautiful setup for Swat Log I've ever seen. Really, really nice. I mean, it's perfect. It's amazing. And, um, but they kept kind of putting out those superstitions. Constantly, constantly, constantly. And I'm, and I'm a big fan of questioning. I think if you're not questioning, you should. And so finally, I kept saying to him, I, I said to Suscapio, I said, you know, why, why all this, why all this fear stuff? You know, it's like you've got the original window, and there's lots of fears to look in the house, and all these different things. And he got mad at me. He says, do you always ask so many questions? I'm like, yeah, I do. I, I think that's always a tell. Like, if people get defensive, that you're challenging a, a ritual or a ceremony or a position, challenging a political thing, if people get indignant, pay attention. Every one of them. Just watch out. Because they're not, they're, they're starting to turn into coercion. And they want you just to do it because they said so. And we don't, it's not just. That, I mean, it's, it's, it's many, many things that I observe in society that it's not okay to question certain things. Well, we should be questioning. That's, that's how we arrive at a better solution. So, I, I don't know if that answers your question. But, yeah.
Yeah, there's, there's a lot of that, and especially when you get into the plans, there's a tremendous amount of superstition. And um, I, I, I would, it would be fine if I, if I saw the outcome in their life be consistent with the, the, the speak or the settlement. Oh, we're all part of Earth, and blah, 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 and all the dancing the walls. But then you see all the crap that goes on that is normalized, you know, the abuse that goes on between you know, people. And, and I kind of go, all right, when did we stop doing that? <laughs> you know? So, yeah, walk the talk. It's a tough one. Yeah. Sure, yeah. I, I'm not sure. I'm a little bit out of touch with the specifics of where they are uh, for, for Maine specifically. I don't know. Um, yeah, I wish I, I could know. I, uh, oh, sorry. I, I wish I I wish I did know. Um, I do. There are folks I could I could ask. I have friends in most of these communities. Um, so it's but offhand, I'm not really sure where they're at. I will. I think one of the challenges in the movie was that people were disappointed with the outcome of they would, they would, they would have a meeting of people coming together, but then there's like three or four people that show up. So I think what that is is growing pains, and I think it's easy, it would be easy to be discouraged, but I think maybe over time um, that, there, that there will be more involvement here and there will be more of a dialogue. Um, our communities are tricky places. The, the, some of these communities are really small, and I was talking to Wendy earlier about, in some ways, the, the, the lack of participation, the lack of coming forth with, with stories and going on the record may seem at first that there's just a fear of wanting to share or money about trauma based, but a lot of it too is the dynamics of the communities themselves. Um, for instance, uh, my mom lives in Swami, and that's one of our kind of it's kind of our reserve area that's an unspoken reserve area of the identity. Uh, and, and I tell you, if there was something like that, I would be reticent to go there, not necessarily because of not wanting to talk about my experience or go on the record, but because of the other community members. Um, we get into this thing that where we see some of the same problems in small towns. You know, we give a, uh, uh, what is it, um, town planning day. And it'd be like one person, and that person walks in the room, and like, oh man, that guy's here. And it kind of shuts people down. And uh, so there's there's a dynamic, that's just a given dynamic, that I think that was part of what was going on here. People are like, you know, they, they go in, they open the door, they check to see who's there, and then they walk out. And some of that had to do with, Seeing strange faces, but some of them have to be the same faces that they are. Uh, so there's, I, I kind of hope that we get to a different place. I, I kind of think that what's going to happen is it's going to be the younger generation that really moves forward with this. And I, I think that I think some of us are kind of thrown up with a little bit more, you know, a little bit more freedom, a little bit more of the emotional speak, and normalize a little bit more of. You know, cultural sensitivity and things like that. Um, I think that's probably the biggest, the biggest change that's happening. That takes time. So, it's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Oh, uh, it's called Don Ryan. So um, Donland, Donland is uh, the word Abenaki or Wapanaki. Uh, Wapan is the, the sunrise, the morning. Aki is the earth. So here we say Abenaki, which means it's up in, which is the dawn, Aki. So it's a little bit misleading because there's different. There's a few different titles like that. I was actually in a film called People of the Dawn. 
So um, at first I thought that's what the word is doing. And I was like, oh, no, it's a different movie. So, um, yeah, I think it's just a good one. So I, what I kind of want to try and throw out to you guys is that I'm trying to I'm trying to use like examples of of Aboriginal stuff to talk about the big picture, not just it's not just like the mess and everything. And um, you know you don't have to go very far even in this community to see some kind of discussion about concerning a racial issue. It's it's pretty much in the face everywhere. So, I, I, I like to kind of talk about it from the standpoint of utilizing this just as an example, but it's my hope is that we're really kind of talking about the human experience more or less. And yeah, so. Yes, please do. Yes. Seems as if you know the 
well, some of the mission was more focused on the product that came from the reconciliation than the process of getting there. Yeah. So uh, this is where, and I want you guys to help me here. What what do we mean? What what is? I wonder what is meant by reconciliation. To leave it just as saying reconciliation. So this isn't just reconciliation for many people. This could be reconciliation for any social issue that is out there. What what is that? Can you guys help me? What you think reconciliation is? Is that a problem? Are we are we saying that there's to reconcile? Is that to come to some degree of just awareness and stop there? Does it, it, does it require, require uh, reparations? Um, like, what is reconciliation? I mean, if two people reconcile their marriage, that means what? Let's go take it there. If you, if you have two people that are broken up and there's some kind of issue and they reconcile their marriage, what does that mean? I mean, the divorce is coming back together. Coming back together, right? So I, I guess that I'm, I'm curious as to what the and what the intention or what the definition of reconciliation is. What do you think it is? Creating something new. Creating something new. New in what way? There's an issue specific to Native people that's kind of a tricky one. When we when we talk about issues around any kind of racial racial or any kind of social justice issue, let's just use race for instance. Okay. So, do you guys know what race horses, like uh, dogs, and Native Americans have in common? We're the only ones that have to carry a pedigree. There is no other race that I'm aware of, certainly not in North America, that has to actually carry the registration that proves that you are that race. Every other identity you take your pick does not require a person to carry a card or have a legal registration or some kind of legal form of affiliation. That is the only we're special that way. So this is something that the, the, the chief and council um, form of politics of what a tribe is and how we define what a Native American person is, in a lot of ways, it's already conforming to what the government standard was. But then, now our own people have, we may not have invented that idea, but what we've mastered it. And so we have our own ways of drawing these very, very distinct lines in the sand. And they're a little different for us as a racial issue from other races or other entities. And so we've gotten very much involved with drawing lines between us and them, creating this polarity, which inevitably just creates conflict. Whenever you have this camp or that camp, there's always going to be some kind of issue that comes up between those two points. That's one of the problems with getting two identifying in one single group or one in any single thing is that it, it, we start to spend a lot of energy defending our position rather than getting into a solution of reconciliation. So we have kind of a challenge there because just by the nature of how we define ourselves as people requires us to say that there's a difference between me and you because I have a card on my wall and a pedigree that proves who I am. That is a real answer. So it creates this thing of my other question is, well, what's an ally? I mean, there's plenty of native people that are not my ally, let me tell you. Plenty. Um, and so like I don't even know what how we really define what an ally is. There's 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 plenty of in, in my case, and this is kind of I'm a little bit of a devil's advocate here of saying there's there's I know there's a lot of people that I that are not native, who I consider far, far greater allies than native people. So we have this issue going on within our communities where we create these lines in the sand. 
I'll give you a very specific example of this abiding. Okay? I was in Maine um, in 2005, I think, and NPR was playing, and there was a vote on the reservation um, about animals, about what your, who, you know, what status you have. And they called it blood quantum. Blood quantum status has nothing to do with blood. Nothing to do. With it. It's a, that's an old throwback. So they said if you had family member, like say that was on a roll, a historical role in the 1930s, and you could track back from that point, then that was your full-blooded ancestor. And you had to mark it, mark your lineage based off of these different baselines. Well, the band council had a vote, and when it was struck with a pen, they said, okay, now everybody that's got an ancestor on the 1970s roles are now the new full blood. And now we're measuring it from that point. This is not a biological marker at all. It's a political marker. So in some cases, some of the speakers that you see on, on this film were considered half-bloods. But with the stroke of a pen, now they're full-bloods. So we have this way of divisively of, of pushing our own people out and saying, well, you, you have children with a non-native person. Now, this person doesn't even qualify. Your grandkids don't even qualify as Indians. They already have a voice now. These are not allies. So I have a real issue when I see a lot of Native folks taking these hard lines of saying, who's an ally, what's not an ally? It's like, look, we got to get all the stuff straightened out. If, if we are still drawing these crazy lines in the sand about defining who is and who isn't based on some silly pedigree, then we're already screwed. I don't know how, if we're still having these battles, which are always ongoing. In Canada, you're either considered a 6-1, a 6-1, or a 6-2. A 6-2 is somebody who has both native parents that are considered status Indians. And in most reservations, that allows you to vote on the band council. If you're a 6-1, it means you're a half-breed, and you're not allowed to vote. I mean, talk about races. So, like, I'm not even sure, we have so much of our own issues to work out about what, how we even qualify, because we're, we're telling people that your, your own grandkids don't even qualify to have a voice in this situation. But it's going to be the grandkids who solve the problem. So, I, I have, I just, I just have a real issue. In 2005, I was not a legal Indian. 2006, I was. The eagle feather that I'm holding in my hand would have been illegal for me to have in my hand uh, in 2012. But in 2000, sorry, in 2015, in 2016, this became a legal thing that I can hold in my hand as a federal cultural item. So these, these are these weird lines in the sand. So I don't know, I'm trying to figure out what this reconciliation means. You know, um, it's not it's not as cut and dry as saying, oh, we're going to make those other people sit outside, and we're going to make them go downstairs. Because half the time we end up doing that to our own people. So I, I I just think that it's a tricky it's a tricky one, and I think it requires us to really kind of get really close to our own, our own issues. Thankfully, the Western Abenaki we we have animals that are gen they are genetically based pedigrees. But they're not based on blood quantum. So, you know, every person that you meet is mixed, and all of us are biracial. I don't know a single Adam who's not. Anybody tells you they are, it's full crap. <laughs> yeah. Good question. Um, it's a strong, it's a weird relationship. UVM has always had this. I, I've always kind of compared it to just let's. I know it's a public school, but sometimes UVM is considered a public IV, referred to, refer to as like a public Ivy League school. That's one of the ways because we have a medical school and a medical training college and all that. Um, but if you compare it, let's just say, to Dartmouth, which is just down the road, 
Um, Dartmouth has an indigenous native students program. It's a smaller school. There's, there's a reason why it has that. It was built into their, their curriculum years ago. But here's a school that is in the same region. Um, it's an even smaller town, yet works actively hard to have, uh, to recruit and native students from all across North America. As a matter of fact, if we wanted to go to a good dance gathering or powwow, um, that was always the to go to. So, um, UVM just, it, it's kind of like, I'm not totally proud of all politics, but it just seems like we're still struggling to even get a foothold. There, there isn't any kind of, that I'm aware of, any specific um, tuition or uh, uh, fellowship or what was the word for, um, scholarship for, for Abenaki students when clearly this you know, you're right in the heartland of our territory. Um, part of that is because the state of Vermont and the, the government allowed for that to be the case for a lot of years. Like I said, only in 2006 were we, we state recognized as a legally protected minority. And then we had to organize our own band roles from that point on. But, so I think that UVM is, in comparison, like if I'm in Canada, like this audience would be half filled with just native students. Uh, part of that's the demographic. I understand that we don't have a lot of native people here, but in comparison to say the prairies, or you know, um, but the we certainly have enough uh, enough native students that are coming up that we actually have federally funded programs in Swanton for for uh, Native American education programs. So that implies if we have enough students to even have a little, you know, after school program, there probably is enough for there to be a few scholarships and have some Abenaki uh, full-time faculty members. It just to me seems like a no-brainer. Um, and it isn't, it isn't really like, I'm not trying to say that it, it, it's a, a victim thing or anything like that, it's just, it's time. And, you know, if, the, if there's, all this other effort is putting into all this progressive speed, you know, and doing all these things and making sure we're, we're protecting everybody's feelings in different ways. To not have that in place, I don't know, I don't get it. I don't understand it. So it may happen, but I think that, but I think that we also need to advocate for ourselves in a way that, you know, not, not just be barking dogs. That's, that's probably the problem too, is we need to advocate for ourselves very well in this one where your school is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrea, um, for the answer. And I have two follow-up questions I'm going to bring into it in the depth. Um, could, you, um, could you share what do you envision or see, or do you even see the value in truth and reconciliation, or even just the truth, um, specifically from the crimes that we have caused to the world? Well, with Perkins and the uh, eugenics, the active eugenics. So, yeah, there was, for those of you who don't know, I think throughout the 19, early 1900s, there was, uh, throughout a lot of the country, there was this whole concept of the human government. And uh, that was basically a way of trying to select for races and religions that were considered to be good way of being. So um, there was a professor here, I think his name was uh, Perkins, I don't know what his first name was. Um, Adolf, I think, no. Uh, uh, he, he was, um, they, they spearheaded a program here that helped um, look directly at how to select for ideal genotypes and, and genotypes. And they targeted specific. They targeted. They didn't call them Native Americans here. Um, our, our people went through by a lot of other names. One is Gypsies. Um, sometimes they just call. They're just like they call them just basically undesirables. And uh, they, there were certain families that were actually targeted, and, and then went through and were given vasectomies or tubal ligations to sterilize. So my aunt, my great aunt. I think was sterilized. Um, 
She's at the, the boarding school in Vermont. So uh, the, the Bradford boarding school uh, is where a lot of mentally you know, disabled people and I who do cautious for very damaged in China. And um, she was there for most of her youth and we speculated that she was part of that eugenics project uh, as a result of being disabled. I don't think it was specifically because she was out of that but um, so that it's a sad thing that I think that some of that information was also used with uh, with, with the Nazis and um, was then utilized as kind of these white widespread sterilizing undesired populations. So uh, the, the question specifically is what? Could you envision or see value in the truth and reconciliation or even just the truth? Um, specific to the harm that you can cause to other people? Yeah, the, the truth is one of those tough things. Um, that, I, 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 again, I'm looking at this as saying, what is the truth? How, how do we define what the truth is? People say, I'm speaking my truth. You know, but somebody's truth is completely out to watch. So I'm, I'm, I'm careful about what we call truth and not mixing that up with fact. That's a real, I think, I think that's a real challenge for all of us as human beings to try to not overlay our images, our thoughts, or our perceptions, because perceptions are the most fallible of all human emotions. And we're getting into a sketchy place in society where if you are part of an institution or a workplace or anything, we have these laws that are supposed to create compassionate and work environments. But the trouble is, is that we're, we're legalizing people's perceptions. And so it, we, uh, an employer or institution is now has to try to listen to and protect people's perceptions. But again, perceptions are really hard. Because if I think that you wearing a black t-shirt is offensive to me, that's my perception. Th that is a perception. That's a perception right there. So perceptions can be abused. Perceptions can be distorted. I mean, a lot of these things. And the truth often falls into that perception category. Uh, you pointed out like, if I'm talking about the, the or, or how our, what I think are the limitations of placing too much emphasis on ceremony for healing. I mean, that's my perception. And somebody else's perception would be like, oh, that's blasphemy if they didn't say that. So that's a perception. So truth is, truth is a tricky one. I don't know what we mean by truth. If we look at the facts and we say that Perkins specifically did X, Y, and Z, well, there's a fact. And I think we can address that specifically. Um, if we want to look at any, any other of these things, we have to really get our personal emotions out of the way and really look at what are the facts, what can we actually agree on is the truth. And um, we still have, there's somebody here, a professor here, I'm not sure who it is, that is still protesting that the Abenaki are who we say we are. It's still an ongoing thing, an ongoing issue. I, I don't purposely don't know who this person's name, but is still putting out that kind of rhetoric that we're not here. So that's in his mind is the truth. And sometimes we get people with a lot of letters after the name, PhD, da da da, that that will say this. We're published and you know if you take this from pure anecdote to public publication. So truth is truth is a dangerous thing. Um, and who's defining the truth? That's the other one that's tough. So I I'd like to sit and, and look at fact and look at what we can actually work with or what a group of people can actually get together on. But otherwise, we're going to be, because I don't think that when we start having too many of these other things that protect people's perceptions, it doesn't create the compassionate environment that we're hoping for it to create. Um, if we go into a workplace and we, we do sexual harassment and we say, you know, racially insensitive things, that's just, you shouldn't do that because it's a dumb thing to do, period. It, it hurts people. And being able to put yourself in their shoes is how you do it. But you should not say those things because you're afraid of losing your job. That shouldn't be the reason you don't say stupid stuff. And so what we're doing with a lot of a lot of the law, a lot of the hypersensitivity that we're working with now, is it's not creating a compassionate environment. 
it's, been, it's making us fearful of God. It's, it's, a, it's an environment where if you don't say the right things, then you know we're all walking on eggshells because we're afraid of this. We're afraid of consequence. Consequence is not compassion. These are two very different things. So I, I'm, I don't know. I, I, I know I'm kind of going around with more questions on what, what is truth? What is reconciliation? Because there might be some people who say, look, if you gave every, every Abenaki person $20,000, that counts as reconciliation. But then there would be some other groups that we don't want your money. You know, so, so where's the reconciliation? Where, where is that line defined? I'm not sure. Yeah. Actually, I actually have a sense that you're taking question because you said that how can you be an ally to the modern people when there is a consensus within the community? Yeah. Okay, excellent. That's that's my point. When I tell you that we 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 infight, uh, there's the analogy of crabs in a bucket. Uh, and if you guys haven't heard this one, it's used for a lot of different groups, but like you have a, a bunch of crabs that have been caught in all the bucket. Yeah, one crab that finally finds his way out of the bucket, he's crawling out of the bucket, just as he's about to be free out of the bucket and run back into the water. His other crabs grab him by the legs and pulls him back into the bucket. And, and we, oh, that is such a big problem with our people. Uh, not just that, but the people, it's, it's all the people, we don't worry about. Um, and there's jealousy, there's animosity, there's different, you know, there's people still their own psychopathologies getting in the way of the big picture. And um, so I think that we're, we're, we're certainly, when I first got into this in the 1990s, early 90s, there was, there was still a lot of issues that then that we've kind of worked through now. So I have seen growth. Um, and I think it's, it's starting to get better, but we still have a lot of other issues that we we, and this is where I think education is important. When I, I try to think of myself as a relatively well-rounded person in terms of North American and Aboriginal culture. That is not because I learned it here. It isn't. I, I'll be the first to tell you that it's not. I, in order for me to have some kind of grasp on not just Indigenous people of North America, but Indigenous people of the world, there's indigenous people all over the world. There's indigenous people in, in the Philippines. There's indigenous people in Taiwan, Australia, China, uh, you know, like in Africa, obviously. But like, they're all over, you know. And so we have to see the commonalities between indigenous peoples that are all around the world, all of the things that are the common struggle. And just to try to get, I think with, with the Abenaki specifically, that we, I'm going to get myself in trouble, but I don't care. We, we need to get ourselves out of our little pinky communities and go elsewhere and realize that, you know, there's more than just the plains, too. It's, there's the entire Arctic and subarctic of Canada. And then there's, and those are our cousins, those are our cousin nations. The language, like the, the Algonquian language stuff, goes from Prince Edward Island all the way out to the Canadian Rockies. That's that's our that's our language now. Huge, huge group. And you see that we have more in common than we have uh, differences. We get so hung up on our differences. And so if we can start to see how much more we actually share with each other, and then we can start to go, oh man. I'm looking at this ceremony happening in the Philippines, in the central Philippines, and I'm like, yeah, I'm seeing something that correlates. If I look at stuff going in Siberia, um, I, I look at Siberian people, and I'm like, they're Indians. Or we're Siberian, one or the other. But we're just siblings, is what we are. And, and you know, same, I look at Mongolia, too, and I look at, like, things that you, know, you see all the flags, all the colors, and the yurts, and I'm like, geez, you know, these are just native people. End of story. It's not that different. So I think if we start to see our common link and we start to look at what the common denominators were, then we could start maybe being able to formulate what we were. There's a saying I really like that until you understand uh, another culture, not as a tourist, but as a participant, 
seeing the good days, seeing the bad days, and noticing yourself. And not just seeing the parts that are pretty and nice, but seeing the whole thing. That you will not understand your own culture. And this is not just for Native people, this is for all of us here in this room. That until you start to really sink into another culture, go elsewhere, spend time, have relationships with different races, do these things, have friends that are, you know, really go into this deeply, then you start to understand yourself. That's where it starts. If you guys don't do that, and you only know the little world that you're comfortable in, or the group that you align yourself in, we're paralyzed. Because we're just preaching to the choir. We're just, we're just hearing the same things that everybody else is saying. It's the same as someone speaking. So we need to always challenge ourselves and get out and go places. And, and for my people, it's hugely important that they do that. Really, really important. Having a native program here would help because that would that would be something close to home where kids don't have to go to a, a super expensive Ivy League school or go to Winnipeg and be able to um, have that peer group that challenges them. You know, the kids who think they're all that until they realize, you know, this kid who braids down to this butt who doesn't really know anything other than the res. That's not the same perspective. When, the first time I went to a chicken dance ceremony, I was asked to teach out in Saskatchewan. I was the whitest looking thing for miles. All these dudes were in this like, really specific ceremony, and all these dudes are singing all these crazy songs, and everybody in there is, is stereotypically Aboriginal looking in as you can Man, I feel it's good. But that's but then, then they start to see me as an equal when we started talking about cultural things. And then we started finding a common ground. And I realized what I didn't know. They realized what they didn't know. It was, then suddenly we started to, you have to be uncomfortable. It's really important to be uncomfortable. Um, so that's one of my, that's one of my things that I'm saying to help people. Yeah. Thank you. That was great insight. Um, the next question is taken into the national level. Um, are there any discussions about sharing government in the U.S. with Indian tribes, whether by Native and Indian representatives or having Indian advisors in the cabinet? We did have a senator, I think, who was Native a while back. I forget his name. Um, I don't know if I'm really bad at politics. It's not a strong suit. Um, our chief can answer this a lot better than I can. Uh, is the question about should we have more of a representation of Native people, or you know, how? Can you help me interpret the question a little bit? If there is any discussion about shared governance of the U.S. with Indian tribes. Yeah, I mean, there's always been discussion. Uh, I think that's at the core of what our, our issues really are. Um, we're, what it's considered is one of the reasons why we have such a strict pedigree system is because, in theory, nations are supposed to be, it's supposed to be a nation to nation relationship. So, like the Abenaki Nation, as well as the Nation. Uh, Abenaki Nation corresponding to the Vermont government or the nation working with the federal government. It's supposed to always be a nation to nation dialogue. Uh, and so, that, I mean, but there's, there's, there's a lot of challenges with that, obviously. It, I, I think it's a nice sentiment to think that it's really a nation to nation dialogue. In some ways it is, in some ways it's protected as such, in other ways it's, it's a complete policy. Um, and, you know, I, I think that there's, there's also a lot of talk kind of goes along the same lines of decolonization. Again, how, how do we define decolonization? I drove here in a Subaru. You know, I didn't walk here, I didn't paddle here. Um, and and I, 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 I hear my own people sometimes talking about this thing like we can suddenly go back to the old days. And like, do you really want to do that? Not if you even could. Sorry, I like antibiotics. I don't know. I just there's there's things about it that just aren't realistic, and I think that part of what what constitutes a living culture, you know, I'm not really answering this question very well. But what constitutes a living culture is one that's evolving. 
when, when, when a language runs out of vocabulary words to compensate for technology, the language is pretty much dead. Um, and throughout the movie, you know, I heard Wabanaki, a dialect spoken, I think, three times. So we, we already have a little disadvantage linguistically. Our, our language is somewhat alive. Some people say it's alive, other people say it's kind of a relic. Um, you know, and but so it's like culturally speaking, like we're we are we are already it's and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that we're evolving as people. Our, I don't think our definition of what makes us what, what we are is limited to some snapshot in the past. Because if we're doing that, we're, we're already we lost that battle a long time ago. If people don't get that, then you know they they are delusional. So it's it's how do we how do we kind of live as we are now as a people? That's you know that that shows that we have vitality, but we're realistic we're here. So I don't really think decolonizing is really even. I mean, I wish it was a different word. It's a strange word to me. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you. And then another question. Um, do you believe the end of acknowledgments that the actual words are meaningful if they are not accompanied by further action? No. No, it's what you say to me. That, that's one of my favorite things lately. I'm surprised that not more people know this word, but uh, to me, virtue signaling. And we live, we live in, a, in a society that goes to virtue signaling. Um, and the, 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 there's a saying that uh, a little Taoism here, uh, Lao, Tzu, Lao Tzu points out, he said, um, virtue that, that looks to acknowledge itself is not true virtue. So a, true, a, a virtue that doesn't seek acknowledgement is actually part of the actual virtue. Um, which means that if it doesn't matter what bumper sticker you have on your car, it's not the bumper sticker that's the virtue. Uh, it doesn't matter how you define yourself or what you tell people, or, you know, all these other things, or what flag you fly. It, you know, that that is a signal. That's not the virtue itself. Breathing is a virtue. Breath doesn't ask for any credit, but we all need to breathe. So that's a virtue. So I think that when we get too stuck on, you know, uh, signaling to society, signaling to peer groups, signaling to that we're in this camp or we're in this camp or or look, we made this acknowledgement, the acknowledgement is not the thing. It, it isn't. It's the signal of the thing, but it's the action that doesn't really lay claim to itself that is the actual virtue. You guys with me on this? It sounds like I'm crazy. Well, you think that crazy? All right. Um, so, and it's very easy because we live in a culture that says, look, and it's, and it's kind of a forced, it's a forced perception too. Like, if I, if I really make a stink and I'm like, you guys have to put this thing up and say that you're, you know, you're guests on our land. And I don't even like the word guests. And I'm like, really? Are you a guest? I, I, come on. You know, it's like, do, are you renting a room at the Holiday Inn? No, that's a guess. I mean, if, if you're, if you're, you know, if your kids are here and they're breathing this air and you shop here and go to Hannaford's and you do that, you're not a guest. You're a resident. This is home. So, and it's home to us. Where do you think we get our food? Some of us go to the grocery store, but or, or go to Hannaford. Some of us hunt, but not much. Most of us is the same as what everyone else does. So it's like we all we're all we're all equal. There's very, very, very small differences between really us and them. I don't really I think then that's where a lot of problems happen. I think it's good from an educational standpoint to understand when you're driving down the road, I'll throw this at you. Because my own people have to do the same thing. My own people are you guys too, by the way. You know, my mom is white. And you know, and is a wonderful person. My dad, who is an Abenaki, is kind of a jerk. So it's like it, it doesn't. This isn't being native. This is some magical thing. You know, there's plenty of native people that 
you know, speak to speak, that you know in your private life, that you're going to take care of people. So my own people had to learn, right, to have to learn how to deculturalize some of the baseline thinking that we have. You know, so if you're driving down the road, you see this big mountain between here and Central Hall, it's got two bumps on it. What do you guys call it? Say it again? Camel's Hump. If you're from really in a, a native, like an Abenaki mindset, you would say, it's just the crouching the mountain. It's just a different perspective of the same thing, but it's 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 having to kind of see that there's a different way of looking at this land and understanding that there was a time that that before before I think 16, 16 something, 1608 was our official date before uh, Champlain came here. So you know, 1608 and before this land had a very different vibe to it, and um, the waterways were our highways. You know, a lot of these places, the mountains and all these things weren't terribly used because what do you do up there? There's no, there's no nutrition on top of the mountain. So, like, we are all these floodplains and all these areas are where our home was. And to try to not see these things just as rivers, but as we're seeing these highways, see, see these places as having a different kind of relationship. And really, the only way that we can actually form a relationship, I know I'm digressing here, but is, is to actually have a dependency on them. Um, and as a birch park canoe builder, I had to learn how to depend on the land to get materials. And I had to obey the seasons and when the trees give up certain materials, where I could get it, where I couldn't get it, you know, understand these things so that I could pay my bills. Suddenly it became real. I think a lot of farmers have more of a relationship with the community than a lot of native people do. And like we, we need to have some kind of really direct relationship in the end. And there's only there's the only one way we have to do it. And that's when I go up into the northern into northern cultures where people still are hunting when they need to hunt and they have different like, harvesting rights and things like that. Um, they have a little bit more of a more of an attachment to land still, more of kind of a basic understanding of what it really means to you out there, not thinking about like sports or something. Mm -hmm. um, so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 